What's up, everybody? This is Professor Keegan, and we are continuing our discussion um, in our first week on myths of race. So this content is supplemental to the synchronous session we had on Wednesday, um, where we discuss common mythic thinking about race in the United States. Um, and we went over several kind of common attitudes that people tend to hold about race that are largely unexamined and untrue when we look at how race actually functions historically, biologically, um, and politically. So today we're just adding a bit more content and overarching kind of um, theoretical concepts to help organize some of that more kind of general information. Um, so this is meant to go along with the Harrison Carbato reading, um, as well as the uh, Harvard implicit bias um, battery for white black distinction. So you should have taken that or you should take it before you write your journal because I'm going to ask you to reflect a bit on what you've kind of discovered about your results in that battery. So to get started, um, um, first of all, we need to talk about frames again. I mentioned frames at the very beginning of the, of the semester. But this reading from Harrison Carbato discusses framing more in depth and um, gives you us a bit more of a kind of working definition of how frames are thought of by media analysis, as well as by psychologists. Um, so I wanted to go back over this concept of what a frame is. Um, according to Harrison Carbato, a frame is a culturally dominant way of interpreting information. Um, so it frames tend to represent the attitudes of the most powerful groups in our society. So they tend to privilege uh, white people, men, um, wealthy people, Christians, right? Groups that are culturally um, dominant and whose values and attitudes have been most thoroughly kind of um, absorbed into the, the shared culture of the United States. So one way to think about this is frames are kind of a way of viewing the world that's informed by or relies on stereotypes about non-dominant groups. Um, so framing is a way of stereotyping. It's almost unconscious way in which stereotypes activate for us in different situations. Um, so we could think of a frame literally as like a picture frame through which information is organized and through which myths kind of are delivered to us. Um, so when we say that a frame represents a culturally dominant way of interpreting um, reality or information, what we mean is that frames teach us to see things in a way that is defined by groups that have more economic, cultural, and political power in our society. So we tend to take on the viewpoints of those groups, um, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, so in other words, a frame is a way in which cultural myths are reinforced by how we project unconscious scripts onto images, information, and situations. And we often do this even without thinking about it. We talked about this last class, but a lot of say racial or gender bias happens precognitively. We learn to us make associations very quickly between things um, as children that then are hard to unlearn or even like realize we're doing later in life. And those associations are very much influenced by dominant um, understandings of race and gender. Um, so frames are both conscious in the sense that we might have some chosen frames in our life, like um, our religious affiliation, our uh, political affiliations. These are things where we might have kind of examined the available frameworks for organizing religion or um, politics in our culture, and then made choices about how to align ourselves very consciously with one or another of those alignments. Um, but there are also unconscious frames around things like race, gender, sexuality that are largely unconscious and have a lot to do with why there's so much bias against, say, LGBTQ people um, or against, say, um, people of color that um, is hard to address because it's happening at a precognitive or unconscious level. So frames are important. They're very important for how media organizes um, racial imagery, imagery. So I started out this lecture with a slide and I wanna take you back to that. Um, these images are an example of racial framing where um, 
two groups of people were charged with burglary on the same day. Um, and uh, these are examples of how the same news station ran those stories. So we see um, for the white men who were um, charged with burglary, they have what looks like yearbook pictures run or where they're in suits. Um, they're all dressed up. They look very respectable, middle class. They don't look like criminals. Um, even though they're accused of a crime. And then on the other side of the image, we have the same news station running um, a story about men, black men, um, who are accused of the same exact crime, but look at how they're framed. They are framed as, with, with mug shots. Um, they're not dressed up in nice clothing. They don't look innocent, right? And so we see how, you know, um, the media reinforces these ideas that people of color are sort of inherently more dangerous or more criminal or more um, guilty than white people. And this stuff saturates our culture. It's, it's kind of everywhere and the racial scripting we get exposed to. Um, so this is just one example of like many others we could point to. Um, so um, facts versus frames, Harris and Carbato are careful to note that when our, when the dominant frame in a culture contradicts the facts in a situation, humans are very likely to rely on the frame and view facts as untrue. Um, so we all tend to believe our frames more inherently than we believe competing information. And that also makes kind of having rational conversations grounded in fact really difficult. Uh, because we're kind of wired to double down on our understanding of the world. And again, remember the, uh, the understanding of the world that we tend to share tends to reflect dominant groups and dominant values. Um, so that's why it's so hard to argue with facts against people who are who hold prejudice, right? Because prejudice is about not, not really paying attention to fact or having uh, a uh, cognitive structure that impairs you from being able to look at facts and fold them into your worldview. So um, a name we use for this is implicit bias. That's what the uh, Harvard uh, battery that I asked you to take is measuring, um, in which we tend to see what we have learned to expect to see. We, we, there are cultural associations, say, between blackness and guilt and whiteness and innocence that go very far back in United States history. And we're all subject to those. We've all been exposed to those frames. And so it's much easier to make those associations. It's much, we make them much more quickly and have to think less about them than say reversing those frames. So that's what that test is measuring. Um, implicit meaning kind of baked in. Um, we don't notice it. It's not like it's not like a form of bias that gets like a lot of attention because it's not how we think of bigotry working. Um, implicit bias is much more subtle and it has to do with our associational patterns. So one thing to think about in your journal is where you might see this operating in your own life or with people around you. Um, we're living in a time in the United States where there is so much frame, strong framing around politics, race, immigration, uh, where people seem to be living in entirely different frameworks and media environments. So I would think just looking around, you might be able to see some of this, like think about climate change. Scientists by and large, 98% of scientists agree that the earth is warming and humans are causing it. And yet we have a whole group of people who insist that can't be true because they have a frame that prevents them from accepting facts. Um, so Harris and Carbato point out that this tends to make factually based arguments ineffective at combating prejudicial frames. And, and that's one of the real challenges here is that we like to think that just presenting facts to people will convince them of the truth. But it turns out that that's not actually the case a lot of the time. And um, you know, frames are a lot more deep seated and tend to prevent us from actually considering fact as fact when we see it in front of us. So I had you take the Harvard Implicit Battery for White Black. Um, it's de designed very much like the doll test that we covered last class um, that was used in Brown versus Board of Education. Um, and I'm really curious what your experience was with this exercise. And I, um, I would like to actually reserve some time in our next synchronous session to talk a bit about it. Um, but I think also for your journal, it might be a good idea to dig in a bit to what 
happened here. Um, again, we might have an understanding of ourselves as less affected by racial frames than we actually are. Um, you know, and this goes back to the point that um, racial frames are largely unconscious. And so therefore we can think of ourselves as someone who maybe doesn't hold these kinds of biases, but then they show up anyway, right? So what does that tell us about frames? What does that tell us about the power of race as a kind of like dominant cultural system um, in, our, in our society? Um, and uh, I wanted to, just for people who weren't in the live session on Wednesday, I wanted to take you over to um, some video about, you know, the explanation for why both white and non-white people tend to end up with the same results in this test, which is a preference for white over black. Even if we are black, we might see a preference for white. Why is that happening? Um, so let me take you over to that material. Um, and we'll, we'll learn a bit more about the doll test and how it worked. The doll test was integral to the Brown v. Board of Education because it clearly demonstrated that separate was not equal and separate was not good. In fact, separate was an injustice. What we're looking at here are the dolls that Drs. Kenneth and Mamie Clark use in their doll studies. The doll tests were a series of studies that Mamie Clark and Kenneth Clark did to try to determine racial awareness in young children, with the implication being that in a segregated society, if children are aware of, of race and the differences in race and the differences in how different racial groups are treated, that it would impact how they felt about themselves. What they did that actually became very well known part of the Brown case was they showed young children black and white dolls and they would ask the children, show me the doll that's nice, give me the doll that's the best, give me the doll that looks like you. And more often than not, the black children showed the doll as the doll, the nice doll was the white doll. The doll that was the best was the white doll. When he got to that last question, give me the doll that looks like you, that's when the children would pause and um, be a bit more confused or looked troubled, as Dr. Clark would say, because they had said in many cases, this is the bad doll, this is the nice doll. And so remembering that they had said, this is the bad doll, they now had to show the doll that looked like them. And um, it was particularly difficult for them. And some children, some black children would do, and some chose the white doll that looked like them because they couldn't embrace. Um, after having said, this is bad, not nice, they um, couldn't embrace it. All right. So that discusses kind of how framing is so powerful that even if we come from a group that's negatively framed um, by dominant groups, we may actually take on those attitudes about our own group, um, which we talked about last class. And that does explain why this isn't just the case with implicit bias of holding attitudes about people we're not familiar with because you know some i think some white people think oh i got preference for white because i grew up in a white community i know white people more uh i am white so i'm just more familiar with white people and so therefore that's why i'm associating white with like these good qualities faster but the truth is that people of color also get the same result generally, which is that they also have a faster station between white and good qualities. And so that does not explain um, 
what's happening, right? It's not simply a preference for our own group. It's a preference for white statistically, no matter who takes this test. Um, and so we saw this uh, last class with several groups of, of kids over about a 30 year period where we saw a test in the 80s and then um, what looked like a test uh, in the 2000s. Um, and we saw, we saw white children, black children and Latino children all mostly choosing the white dolls as the good doll. Um, and what I should want to show you now is how global this is, um, because remember, whiteness was set up as a, a system of dominance in a globally colonial moment, right, where uh, Europeans were inventing racial categorization as a way to kind of take over and dominate lots of different areas of the, of the world. And so even over in Italy, um, we see the same preference with Italian children. So I'll show you that now. Quale bambola è bianca? Quale bambola è nera? Quale delle due è bella? Mm, questa. Qual è quella bella? Qual è quella brutta? E qual è quella buona? Quale è cattiva? Qual è buona? Lei. Perché è buona? Perché gli occhi celesti. Quale è cattiva? Perché è cattiva? Perché è tutto, tutto nero. E qual è la bambola che ti somiglia di più? So what you'll notice here is that even in another cultural context, right, outside of the US, we see the same results uh, pretty consistently here. And the kids say the same exact things about the dolls that they said in a US context. Why is the one doll pretty? Because she has blue eyes, right? Why is the other doll bad? Because it's all black, right? Um, the, this, this racial hierarchy of value is globally consistent and it has to do with white supremacy as a system that was set up under settler colonialism and settler colonialism was like a global project kind of uh, set up by European people, right? So um, a lot of countries are affected by this scale of like racial value. Um, and we could re probably reproduce this test in a lot of places, um, even in Africa where there still is preference for lighter skinned people over darker skinned people. Um, so, uh, I like to end with this, this quote from Albert Einstein because I think it's actually speaking to the power of racial framing that like once this stuff gets into people's heads, they reproduce it in a way where here we have like five-year-old kids doing it, right? They, they know very well that darker color is bad. Um, and we see the struggle that those um, um, kids have with pointing at the black doll and saying that one looks like me, even though I know it's the bad doll. Um, and that's an example of why um, frames, um, you know, end up producing similar results across racial populations with implicit bias tests. So uh, back to my slides here. 
um, hopefully that kind of gives you some context for your results. Um, people get a variety of results with this battery, um, but by and large, uh, it does tend to reveal preference for European uh, faces or white faces, um, regardless of the group that takes it. Um, so uh, we talked about common myths about race last class, and today I want to add to those by adding two major myths about race. These are kind of the overarching myths that kind of cause all this other myth making to happen. And these are both covered in the, uh, the reading that we did for today. So the first one is the myth of white supremacy, um, which is the myth that whiteness is ideal, white people are superior to other groups and white culture should be preserved at all costs. Um, and this myth sees race as deeply meaningful and views white people as the rightful owners of American society. Now, um, this myth is more kind of evident at different periods in the United States history. Um, I would say it's highly evident right now um, under the current political climate. We do see a lot of kind of activity among what with white supremacist groups. We see a lot of appeals to these sorts of attitudes about who the real Americans are. Um, we have an immigration policy right now that is very draconian and that is is clearly designed to uh, keep certain people out of America and prevent them from becoming American and um, particularly people of color and um, non Christian people. And we do see a lot of efforts to like kind of preserve um, America, a sense of America as like mostly run and owned by white people. That's kind of what the, the overarching national kind of climate is like right now. Um, and under the under this myth, there's another myth that that might seem like a competing myth, um, which is the myth of the melting pot, um, which is another common major myth about race that's active in other periods, maybe kind of under say the Obama era, this would be the dominant myth that was more active. And it, this myth asserts that the US is an open and equal country in which all men are created equal and in which everyone has an equal chance to, to assimilate and succeed. And this myth teaches us that race is not meaningful and does not play a role in a person's success or failure, right? So it could seem like these myths are opposite because one says race is really meaningful and that white people are better. and and one myth says race doesn't matter at all and everyone's equal, right? So they seem opposite. And I'm guessing that a lot of you have been exposed to myth number two, at least in school, where you know we used to have a, a racist society with slavery, but like then we, we, we abolished slavery and we had all the, the civil rights movement activities. And so now we live in a post-racial society, right? That was a really common way of thinking um, just maybe five, six, seven years ago. Today, uh, myth one seems to be more active. And we would think, oh, these are opposite myths. However, um, I wanna talk a bit about whether or not these are actually opposite. So in US history and culture, we often use this second myth of the melting pot to, to propose solutions to the, to the first myth. Like, oh, well, we had a bad past but now everyone is kind of together in America and, and we've gotten rid of racial distinctions in law. And so everyone is one big kind of group and there's no um, racial distinction anymore in our culture, right? Um, we often teach kids that. Um, however, the melting pot myth and the myth of white supremacy are not oppositional. They're actually complementary, which means they complete one another, they go together. Let me explain this some more. So if the myth of white supremacy is the original myth of race used to justify indigenous removal, African slavery, segregation, and racial hierarchy, right? Um, the melting pot myth is supplemental um, and is a myth used to assimilate desirable immigrant populations and deprioritize the history of white supremacy. So um, like, oh, we're over it now. Um, everyone can just come in and we're going to be a big diverse melting pot society. So although they seem like opposites, these two myths are actually complementary to one another because they work together to produce a system of thought that keeps white cultural norms in place. So um, the first myth is overtly uh, about keeping white people in charge. And the second myth is about 
kind of covering over the fact that white people still have most of the power and money by kind of pretending that everyone is equal, even though we see that if you look at the data, people of color still are not experiencing actual equality in the United States. So the myths go together and work together to produce a system of thought that keeps white people kind of the normative group or the dominant group. Because if racial minorities and immigrants succeed in the United States, it's usually through assimilating into white culture. So this idea that you kind of have to give up your language, you have to give up your religion if it's different from Christianity, you have to dress, talk, sound, have names that look like white names, right? You have to kind of assimilate to whiteness as much as you can. Um, but if you can't, you know, black people are never going to be white people, right? Like. Um, there, there are just some groups that can't do that effectively or do not wish to um, if you're religiously different um, and wish to retain your religion. Um, you know, you're going to be marked as, inf as different and therefore inferior and you're going to end up being excluded, right? So either way, white people are either overtly kind of the dominant group or there's this set of kind of implicit expectations that you behave as much like white people as possible in order to get ahead. Uh, and groups have had to kind of make decisions about how to position themselves in this kind of mythic system of race. So the myths go together. They don't actually oppose one another because we see that under both myths, whenever, which, whenever whichever one is dominant, white people remain kind of the dominant group regardless. Um, so, um, along with these myth, myths come some dominant racial frames. Um, remember frames are the way that we organize mythic structures and kind of apply and see the world. Um, so one of the first frames is what I call the racial danger frame, which is a frame that teaches us, meaning white and non-white people all, to see people of color as dangerous and immoral and whites particularly as needing protection from them. Um, and it, it carries uh, a number of assumptions, right? Um, people of color under this frame are seen as lazy, undeserving, and inherently criminal. Um, it is impossible for people of color to be framed as innocent victims in this frame. Um, law and order must be maintained to protect whites from racially motivated violence. This is a very active part of the frame right now um, that like, you know, we see a politician saying law and order, law and order um, as a way of kind of getting white people to be scared of non-white people. And therefore the racial danger frame is a frame that supports the white supremacy myth. It, it supports and organizes and delivers that myth to us um, because it teaches white people that non-white people are um, inferior, dangerous, must be controlled, need to be dominated, need, you know. Um, so this can be a very active frame. But the other frame is the colorblind frame. And this is a frame that teaches us to not see race and its discriminatory effects. Um, and it carries these assumptions. One, racism is largely a thing of the past. Two, only a small number of extremely bigoted people are racist. Three, any mention of race is automatically racist. So you can't even talk about race um, because then you're like being a person who sees people's race. Um, and so therefore the colorblind frame supports the melting pot myth. And so for each of these dominant myths, racial danger and melting pot, or I'm sorry, um, white supremacy and melting pot, we have a dominant frame that goes along with them, which is racial, racial danger or colorblindness. Um, and these get kind of, they work as delivery systems for racial information in our society. Um, and they go together to form kind of a coherent whole in which one, the colorblind uh, frame is kind of covering over and making it impossible to talk about the conditions that white supremacy has produced, right? It's a way of kind of, it's that culture of denial um, that uh, we talked about on Wednesday. This is how we continually deny those historical effects of race. So um, in the reading, the authors are talking about media coverage of Hurricane Katrina, which was a hurricane that devastated New Orleans.
and left a lot of people just kind of like stranded in New Orleans um, because the federal government really mishandled the crisis. And in the ensuing um, kind of disaster, there was a lot of uh, racialized media coverage. And so they are talking about these two photos, photo A and photo B that I'm showing you here and kind of how people who were victims of this crisis were framed by the media. And um, they're talking about how image A, uh, which is of a young, what looks like black boy um, who's found some bread and is um, looks like carrying some other things. He was described as looting a store and looting meaning like stealing, like opportunistically stealing things. Um, but these white people were described by the same media outlet as finding these resources that they have. Um, and so again, if we were to analyze this framing, we could say that um, this is an example of racial danger framing, which would support also the narrative of white supremacy because the, the black person is immediately presumed to be a criminal and the white people are immediately presumed to be innocent because they're just innocently finding things whereas the, the black person is taking and stealing and is uh, you know, framed as, as a criminal element, right? So um, this is one way in which um, the media kind of reproduces these frames for us, like you know, almost without thinking we absorb this kind of information. Um, so I'm gonna ask you to think about these frames and think about your implicit bias results and remember, implicit bias means it's out of your control. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't be surprised if some of us got results on this, this quiz or test that make us think twice about um, our, our response times in, in relation to racial frames. Um, so let's talk about that a bit and please do um, reflect on that in your journals, okay? So I will leave it here and we will talk more next session. All right, talk to you later.